finding an RTX 3080 for review purposes wasn't an easy feat. After the whole fiasco regarding the capacitors, which was, in my humble opinion, unfounded, we won't be seeing ASUS Tough and ROG Strix models on the store shelves anytime soon. However, that does not stop us from showcasing the ASUS ROG Strix 3080, its overclock potential, memory and chip frequency, as well as its acoustics and thermal characteristics. We will also be briefly talking about the farce, which placed ASUS at the top of the chain. The 3080 is pure perfection, and we will illustrate this in the next few minutes. I never was a fan of RGB, as the outside appearance of a product isn't the selling point for me. It's always nice to have RGB as an option, but it's even better when you can actually switch it on or off if you prefer so. We see some drastic changes on this card, with a completely new design overhaul, fans, cooler, as well as a bunch of other goodies. The color scheme of the card is black and gray, which will appeal to most, and the RGB is situated at the very top. What's interesting to note is that now you can actually see the RGB even when the card is mounted vertically. RGB enthusiasts will also be glad to hear that the lights are now transparent, which means that they will illuminate the fans as well. At the front of the card is a mixture of plastic and metal and three powerful axial fans. If you take a closer look, you'll see that the middle fan is a bit different to the others as it has 13 instead of 11 blades. At the bottom side, there is a metal backplate which is there to protect and reinforce the PCB, but its job is also to reduce the temperature of certain components, such as the VRM section or the memory chips. There is also a small slit on the bottom side which allows for better airflow. For video output, the card has three DisplayPort 1.4As and two HDMI 2.1 connectors, as well as HDCP support, which is more than enough for the majority of users. It's a relatively beefy card, which means it will take up around three slots in your case, or 2.9 to be more precise. The card is powered through three 8-pin connectors, which is, in theory, around 450 plus 75 watts from the PCI slot, which means you will need at least a 750 watt power supply in order to accompany this card with a mid-range CPU and at least 850 watts for a more powerful one. What can prove useful to some is that the card has a BIO switch which you can use to change the mode from performance to quiet, but the card has no temperature issues and is so quiet that you probably will not need to switch it to quiet mode. And I almost forgot to mention the most important thing, you get an ROG ruler in the package as well. ASUS gave me the green light to tear the card apart and show you the PCB and the layout, but when the card is so quiet and cool, it would simply be a shame to tear it apart as the components inside are top of the line. Now, let's take a brief look at the thermal performance of the card, and this is the segment in which the card did brilliantly. It can be a rather daunting task to cool down a card with a 350 to 450 watt TDP, but ROG truly did something brilliant here. On automatic settings, the card's temperature fluctuated between 65 and 67 degrees in Fermark, while the RPM of the fans was somewhere around 70%. This number might seem a bit alarming to you, but it's worth noting that the fans were almost completely silent until they worked at around 80% speed. The next Fermark graph shows how much the temperature depends on the RPM, and you can clearly see that the fans play a crucial role when it comes to cooling the card. At 50%, the card worked at nearly 90 degrees Celsius, while the temperature was only 55 when the fans were working at 100%. We got similar results in all the video games which we tested, as the temperature oscillated between 60 and 65 degrees depending on the resolution and the settings, while the RPM stayed somewhere between 60 and 70%. The numbers speak for themselves as the card remains quiet even on the most recent titles. All the testing was done on an open case, which is one of the reasons why the card performed so well. If you opt to install the card in a closed case, first make sure that it has good airflow. High quality coolers and CPUs are also desirable, as this Ampere chip isn't as efficient in heat distribution as I expected. <laughs> 
The Axial fans are the true stars of the show as they are the ones that truly reduce the temperature. In the following segment, we tested the power consumption of the card, which you can see on the graphs. In all the scenarios, the card never went above 370 watts, which means that in practice, we don't actually need those 450 watts. The frequency of the memory and the chip are also commendable, as this card works flawlessly for a longer time at frequencies above 2000 MHz, which is not something that the products from the previous generation could write home about. When benchmarking the card in Port Royal, we see that the frequencies decrease incrementally as the temperatures increase, which is of course expected. Still, the card greatly outclasses its competitors in this aspect. Not only in the benchmarks, but in video games as well, the card maintained a stable workflow above 2000 MHz. If we look at the back side of the card, we'll see that ASUS installed a 0805 multi-layer ceramic capacitor with the capacitance of 470 microfarads. At the very last moment, ASUS decided to change up the structure of the capacitors, so they decided to go for 60 ceramic capacitors instead of the 6 polymer aluminum capacitors which they used for the previous cards. It's obvious that ASUS thoroughly went through the feedback that they received, as the low-end graphics cards such as Pallet and Zotac can barely go above 1800 MHz. Although, the inclusion of the multi-layer ceramic capacitor is commendable, and I'm certain that it does increase its speed by a few dozen megahertz, the smaller problems lie elsewhere. Firstly, the AI algorithm which is used to auto-boost the card makes a lot of noise. Secondly, most of the users who reported problems used mid-range power supplies, while for our purposes, we use the 750 watt Seasonic Prime Ultra Titanium, which falls into the top tier. EVGA also confirmed on their website that the capacitors in these cards relatively affect the performance and the stability of the card, but there are tests on the web which show that the problem actually lies in the drivers. The story goes far beyond this, and it's evident that ASUS has profited from the whole capacitor fiasco, and it would not surprise me if this was part of their marketing campaign. During the tests, we saw little to no increase in terms of FPS, but the card did consume more power, around 70 to 100 watts more, which definitely affects the temperature and the RPM, which consequently will make the fans more noisy. In Port Royal, the performance was 3-4% better, but when testing The Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Red Dead Redemption 2, and Horizon Zero Dawn, the overclocked card performed the same way it did before the overclock. The only relatively noticeable jump in performance could be seen in Gears Tactics, and that is essentially it. The fact that the card does not perform well when overclocked is actually a good thing. As I said in the previous segment, the default clocks themselves are high, and quite a bit higher than those of their competitors. Now, let's get to the practical part as we test a bunch of popular and demanding titles on the system. The first game that we tested was Deus Ex Mankind Divided, which performed better on DX11 rather than DX12, as you can see on the screen. Surely, the numbers are not that much higher, but even a 5% frame increase was enough for us to opt for DX11 for the rest of the titles. Deus Ex is quite the demanding game, which the results confirm. On very high settings, at 4K, we got around 79 FPS, and it didn't drop below 64. The game looks wonderful, and the frame rate is silky smooth as well. Reducing the resolution to 1440p, or as some common folk call it, 2K, Deus Ex received an enormous FPS increase, and worked at 135 FPS, dropping to 100 in some demanding sections. Lastly, we set the resolution to 1080p, where we could not really see a huge jump in performance. The RTX 3080 managed to render the game at 150 FPS, whilst the lowest frame rate remained the same as with the 2K resolution. You can clearly see that the difference in performance between 1080p and 1440p is only 10%, and this can be attributed to the Ryzen 3700X CPU. However, don't think this is due to a bottleneck as the game engine can also greatly hinder or boost the card's performance. Next up is the strategy game Total War Troy Saga. 
an awesome title for testing the processor and the memory bandwidth of the graphics card. I only set the visuals to high with FXAA on, as everything else drastically affects the performance and is not graphics card related. At 4K, the 3080 managed to run the game at 116 FPS on average, while the 1% lows amounted to 99 FPS. We can see a huge jump in performance at 2K, as the game now ran at 180 FPS, while dipping to 140 at certain points. Decreasing the resolution to 1080p, like with Deus Ex, we saw little to no improvement in terms of performance. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is already a regular title in our benchmarks, at least until its sequel comes out. On high settings with TAA on and the DirectX 12 API, the game ran at 115 frames per second, going down to 80 frames during the demanding sections. The game looks spectacular in 4K, and I truly recommend playing it like this if you can afford it. For those of you who own a 144Hz monitor, Shadow of the Tomb Raider averaged exactly 144 frames, while it plummeted to 95 at certain points. Like the titles before, the tests bore the same results with 1080p. Recently, we started including Red Dead Redemption 2 in our benchmarks, and this test made me certain that this card is truly ahead of its time. We set the game to custom high at 4K, and you can go through this amazing adventure at 76 frames on average, while the minimum frame rate was borderline, sometimes falling to 60 FPS on the dot. There was an apparent performance boost when testing the game at 2K, as the card managed to render the game at 115 FPS, while the most demanding scenes were rendered at around 87 frames. For the very first time in this test, we see a significant jump in terms of performance at 1080p, as the game ran at 135 frames on average, while the minimum frame rate fluctuated somewhere around 100 FPS. The game looks breathtaking even at 1080p, and you can only imagine how good it looks at 4K. Horizon Zero Dawn is a fresh new title which hits the hardware hard. We wanted to truly destroy the card, so we put the settings on Ultra. On average, the game worked at 72 FPS, plummeting to 60 in some demanding parts. Reducing the pixel count to 1440p, the game retained its wonderful visuals and worked at 110 frames, while dropping to 90 at certain points. By further reducing the resolution to 1080p, we once again noticed a solid boost in performance, where the game was rendered at 140 FPS on average, with a 100 FPS minimum. Another title that can truly take hardware to its limits is Metro Exodus. The benchmark test in the game can especially do that, but as it does not truly showcase the performance of the game itself, we opted for the more realistic approach and tested the game in story mode. The card ran this game at 84 frames per second at 4K, while the frame drops reached their lowest point at 64, which is quite a satisfying result. By lowering the resolution to 1440p, we get 110 FPS, the minimum being 90. At 1080, the performance was stellar, and you could probably enjoy it to its fullest even on a 144Hz monitor as the frames rarely drop below that point. Gears Tactics might not be a well-known title, but still, I adore the performance results that we got on this one. On high settings, while increasing the resolution to 2160p, it ran at 67 frames per second and it stayed that way with some incremental drops. You don't really need more FPS in titles like this one, so the frame rate is satisfying. At 1440, the frame rate improved drastically, peaking at 110, and it remained stable throughout the test. Further reducing the resolution to 1080p results in a measly 10% increase in performance. On a trip down memory lane, we tested Resident Evil 3 where we truly felt the nostalgia. With visuals set to max at 4K, the game rendered and stayed at 85 FPS. At 1440p, the frame rate nearly doubled at 154, while the more demanding scenes made it drop to 127 frames. There was also a big increase in performance when we reduced the resolution to 1080p, and as a result, we got 230 FPS, while the lowest frame rate that we saw was 200. As we are waiting for the new Far Cry, we decided to incorporate New Dawn into our repertoire. 
We set the visuals to ultra and turn on the HD textures to take the car to its limits and it did not disappoint. The 4K test bore fantastic results as can be seen on the left side of the screen. On average, the game rendered at 94 frames per second, while the minimum frame rate was 60. We see performance improvements at 2K, but they're not as considerable as in the previous titles, and 1080 unfortunately was no different. On both 2K and 1080p, the game ran at 110 FPS, spiking down to 75 on hardware-heavy segments. For those of you who want to see all of the results, I've made a graph with all the games we tested. On the next graph, we see the difference in performance between the 2080 Ti and this card. Depending on the resolution, the 3080 will give you up to a 30% increase at 4K and 20% at 2K, while both of the graphics cards perform the same at 1080p. When compared to the RTX 2080, its predecessor, the 3080 offers a 45% increase in performance at 1440p and a whopping 70% at 2160p or 4K. This is a staggering increase in performance, especially if we take into account that the price of both graphics cards at launch was $700. My final thoughts in regards to the new generation of graphics cards in terms of performance is that the more we overload the cards with higher resolutions, crazy settings, or ray tracing, the difference between the Turing and Ampere graphics cards will be more apparent. Is it a smart choice to purchase the 3080 at launch? Absolutely! But what makes me even more excited is that we'll be able to purchase cheap Turing cards after the 3000 series launch. We hope that you enjoyed this review, and if you did, please leave a like and share the video. It really helps us out. In the upcoming days, you can expect a PCI test as well as ray tracing so we can finally see if the Ampere cards are capable of rendering shadows and lighting as marketed. Are you going to purchase the 3080 at launch? Or are you waiting for the 1080 Ti prices to drop like me? Tell us in the comments below. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.